Um, tell you what, let's, uh, let's start out by taking a look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 6, 3, 16 through 17. And uh, while you're flipping there, um, we are going to be talking about the, uh, the Trinity this morning. Um, so you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, uh, that's about Jesus' baptism. So what does that have to do, uh, anything in the world, with um, the, the Trinity? Well, um, we've been going over and taking a look at some of the things that we believe. And last week we looked at what we believe about the Bible. And today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what we believe about the Trinity. And we're going to read this text verse, and uh, at the same time, you may see that up on the board, I've got a bunch of Bible verses, because even though this is the text verse, this is not what we're going to start out, I mean, this we're going to start out with, but we're going to be going all over the place, and literally, we're going to be taking a look at a bunch of Bible verses, so I thought it was just easier to put up on the board a bunch of Bible verses than to actually write them all out, even though they'll be written out later, okay? But in Matthew chapter 16, uh, or chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, the reason why I wanted to start out here as far as looking at the Trinity is because there aren't very many places in the Bible where we see and, you know, have it written down where the Trinity is there. And this is one of the very few places that, it's, that it is. And so that's why I wanted to start out in this verse to just simply read it and talk about it. Uh, and then before we go on, take a look at all the other things. But when we look at the Trinity this morning, I want us to just kind of ask ourselves a question, well, what, what in the world is the Trinity? I mean, I, I know that uh, for a lot of people, you've been around in church a little bit, you probably have heard the word Trinity before. You probably have heard, oh, well, God three in one. You may have heard God, Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost, or God, the Holy Spirit. Um, so we may have heard about those things, but if you stop and think about it, what really is the Trinity? Now, I don't know that we're going to really answer that question this morning because I don't know if it's something that we can really understand. But I think that there are some things that we can understand, and those are some things that we're going to look at this morning. And in addition to that, I want us to take it a little bit step further, not just simply understanding what the word means, not just simply understanding a little bit more about it, but also just simply stopping to think, well, what does that really mean to us? What what can we take and what can we do with, uh, with this little bit of information? All right? Okay, so starting out with, let's just simply talk about what is the Trinity. And, um, well, I guess that's not working. So, um, what is the Trinity? Okay, so looking at uh, the definition here, we, uh, we see that the word Trinity actually means three in one. And so when we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about um, we've got three different persons of God. And those three different persons of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all combine into, not even the word combine. This is where, where things get tricky because, uh, you know, words, we don't really even have words to, to express this. And so if you think that I'm stumbling over my words, I am because it's hard to, you know, really come up with the right words that are going to, to uh, express all of these things. But we've got these three different persons, but we've got one God. we got one God, but we've got three different persons. And so how does all of that work? That is what is, I guess, the mystery of the Trinity. And we've got God, and God is in three distinct persons, if you will. In that uh, passage that I read, we've got God the Father, we've got God the Son, and we've got God the Holy Spirit all present there in uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. You know, here we have God the Son because we've got Jesus, naturally. He went underneath the water and He came back up. We've got God the Spirit because it says so right there, and the Spirit is taking the form of a dove 
a peace, uh, showing peace that is coming and landing on Jesus. And then we've got God the Father with the voice that rings out from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. And so therefore, that's how we know that there's the Father. And so you can't really say, oh, well, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is just, you know, different ways that God operates because what we see here is we've got three distinct persons of the Trinity. And not only that, but we need to understand is that these three persons of the Trinity are all equal with one another. They are all God. And so um, you can't really say, oh, well, God the Father's on top. And then there's God the Son, and then there's God the Spirit. No, they're all equal with each other. And at the same time, they're all eternal as well. And so it's not as if God the Father existed in the past, and then along comes God the, the Holy Spirit, and then later on with uh, His uh, incarnation comes Jesus Christ the Son. No, it doesn't work that way. What we're going to see is that all three of these are eternal. Now, I know that we use the word persons quite a bit, but like I say, when, when you look at at wordage, um, you know, we, we really don't even have the right words to, to use for this, you know, even though we say persons, I don't want you to think, oh, well, there's three different gods there, there's three different persons, because the Bible talks about there being one God, and I know that's confusing to say, well, wait a minute, how can there be three persons but one God? Well, that's why the word persons really doesn't make sense. There's some uh, theologians that will use the word personalities. And although that gets away from the idea that, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about three individuals that make up God by committee, because that's not what the Trinity is, um, the word personalities doesn't really cut it either. I've, I've heard the word personages used before, but I don't even know if that really makes any sense either. You see, when we talk about the Trinity, and like we're talking about, um, you know, comprising, or we're talking about making up, or we're talking about personages, we really don't have the right words in humanity to describe this, and at the same time, we, we really don't even have the right comparisons for this either, because we don't have anything like this that is in this physical realm that we can compare it to. Now, there's a lot of times that people will take analogies and use analogies to illustrate different things about the Trinity. And at the same time, every time that somebody takes an analogy and uses it to illustrate the Trinity, there is a, 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 a thing that, that is lacking in it altogether. For example, this is one analogy that I've used before and, and seen before about uh, the Trinity, and that is that the Trinity can be compared to an egg. You know, you've got one egg, but you've got the shell, you've got the white, and you've got the yolk. Okay, so you think, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. You know, there's just one egg, but you've got three different parts to that one egg. And those three different parts are distinct from one another, and they comprise the whole. But the only problem is that you've got an individual yolk, you've got an individual white, you've got an individual shell, and that's not the way the Trinity is. The Trinity is not God by committee. It's not that you've got one God over here called the Father, one God here called the Holy Spirit, one God here called the Son, and they all get together, and when they all come together and mix up together, then that's what and who God really is. You see, that's not what the Trinity is. The Trinity really is one God, one God, period. You know, not three gods, not three gods getting together, but one God in three persons. And you say, but that doesn't make any sense. I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's just simply the way it is. Now, here's another analogy that I've sometimes used, and that is that, you know, you can have a, a, a man who is a father, a son, and in, in my case now, a grandfather, right? Okay, but one man. And so, you know, that kind of makes sense too that you've got these three different roles that we're talking about. And the God the Father is operating in a specific role. He is the one who is the Father. We've got God the Son who is operating in a specific role. We've got God the Spirit who is operating in a specific role or really roles because he does many different things. But at the same time, 
Um, this is not God doing something over here like a, a man would be a grandfather in one particular thing. And God doing something over here and being a son in another sense or doing something over here and being a, 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 um, you know, a father. It, it, God doesn't work like that. The Trinity is not that way because of all of those different distinctions that are there. Again, going back to, to Matthew chapter 3, we see that Jesus was present. We see that the Father was present. We see that the Son or the Spirit was present. All three of these were distinct. All three of these were equal. All three of these are eternal, but there are not three gods. And I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the point is just simply this. We don't have anything to compare this to in this life, and we don't have anything that we can um, make an analogy or at least an accurate analogy for altogether. Instead, what we need to do is just simply say, okay, even though I don't fully understand this, I can take by faith what I do know, what is revealed to me, and I can just say, okay, I'm going to believe this, and I can understand what is revealed to me. And when we take it from there, then we can start to work with it and we can start to go on from that point. And I know that some people will say, well, wait a minute, it, it's illogical, it doesn't make sense, there's no way that we can understand it, so, you know, there, there, there's no rhyme or reason to it. But, you know, I want to remind you that there's a whole lot of things about God um, that we can't understand. You know, for example, the fact that God is eternal. Can you really understand that? Can you really comprehend that? Can you have any sort of analogy, human analogy, that would accurately portray that? No, you can't. And the reason for it is because we live in a finite existence where eternal is an infinite existence. We can kind of imagine eternal going forward, right? because we have a future in front of us. So that's something that we can see and relate to, but try to understand eternity going backwards. It's hard to do, isn't it? Because at least in my mind, I'm always thinking there's a beginning point. And I'm always thinking, well, what was before that, right? And so, you know, if we've got God, well, there's got to be a beginning point to God. And what was before that? No, it, it, there isn't anything like that. You see, God is eternal, and that's something that we can't fully understand, and it really stretches our, 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 our thoughts and really stretches our understanding about things. But we just simply say, okay, that's the way it is. God is eternal. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an ending. He is just simply all existing. He is the great I am, all right? And so from there, we just kind of say, okay, I accept that, I believe it, and we go on with it. And the Trinity is a lot the same way. How can there be three in one? It doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't make any sense to us because we have nothing to relate to it. We have nothing to compare to it. But then again, we're talking about God. And for us to simply say, oh, well, we can understand things about God. And if we don't understand this about God, then therefore it's not correct. Then aren't we putting God in our own little box and aren't we trying to make ourselves above him? It doesn't work that way. What does work is to understand that God is who he is and God is who he says he is and what he's revealed to us. And we just simply need to accept that and we need to believe it and go on to it. Okay? All right, so from there, how do we even know that this concept is true? You know, you were saying, okay, the Trinity is three in one. And so, you know what, um, if, if, if that's so, and if you're saying that the Bible is, um, is if that's what the Bible is talking about, then, then show me from the Bible uh, where all of this is. Because after all, when you go and you take a look at the Bible, you know, you, you open your Bible to a, a concordance. You, you get your phone out and do a, a Bible word search. You search for the word Trinity, and you will find that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And so you say, okay, well, the word Trinity is in the Bible. Then, then you know, it's not there. Well, no, it is. It, it is there in concept. The word Trinity is just simply something that we have come up with so that we can kind of understand and frame the, the, the concept of, of uh, who God is. And so 
Um, can we go, can we look at the Bible, and can we see that the, the Trinity is real and exists? And yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. Now, starting out with, I want you to ask yourself this question here, and that is this. What constitutes God? Have you ever thought about that for a second? What constitutes God? I want you to take a look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20, okay? Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. And let's just think for a minute. How, how do we understand, you know, what God is? What are we going to say? If we're going to say, okay, how and what sort of characteristics can we come up with and say, this is God. Well, let's take a look at this verse, and let's see if we can point some things out and pick some things out, all right? So Romans chapter uh, 1 and verse number 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen by being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Now, from there, I want us to see a little bit about who God is and what constitutes God. I want you to see that, uh, first of all, when we look at this verse, is that God has got to be the creator, right? You know, if we're going to say who or what is God, the one thing that we've got to say is that God has got to be the one who is the creator of everything. As a matter of fact, if you're going to say that God is not the creator, of everything, then you've got to have something else out there that is God. You've got to have something that is going to create something. All right. So in this case, that something that creates everything has got to be, by very definition, very by very thing, God. And what we see in this verse is that the things of this world, this creation that God has created really does show us a couple of things. It shows us that, that somebody has made it, and what it shows us is a couple of characteristics about what is made. And what we see is that this God who has created everything is this God is all-powerful, right? I mean, for someone to go and create the heavens, for someone to go and create the earth, for someone to go and create us, I mean for crying out loud, for somebody to just simply go and create a, a bush, <laughs> a, you know, a rock. I mean, that person has got to be all powerful. And so when we think about God, what we need to understand is that God is um, omni, uh, uh, omnipotent. God is not just simply the biggest kid on the block, so to speak. If we're thinking about God being the biggest kid on the block, then we've got a, a wrong view about things already because, after all, you go a couple blocks over, there's probably a bigger kid. And so if our concept of God is that God is the strongest and the biggest in this universe, then we've, we've got a, a wrong base right there. Because God is the creator of this universe, then God is superior to this universe. And by very definition, the one that is going to be the absolute creator is going to be absolutely God. And so God is all-powerful. Now, something else, and that is this. When we look at God, is that God is eternal, okay? One thing about God, and we see this in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20, is that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power in divine nature is being clearly seen. And so one thing that we need to understand is that God, since He is not part of this creation, is that God is infinite. God exists beyond this creation, and He does not have a beginning, neither does He have an ending, okay? And so if you think about what constitutes God, the very fact that He's the Creator, the very fact that he's all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere, all-present, by the way, and the fact that he's eternal, you know, those are, are some pretty good things to point out and figure out, right? Okay, so here's the question. Does God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, do they match these things in the Bible? And yes, they do. Starting out with, Let's take a look at the fact that God is the creator. Take a look at James chapter 1 and verse number 17, starting out with James chapter 1, verse 17. By the way, 
I'm going to go these thing, through these things pretty quickly, and so if you, you don't get there in time, well, too bad. <laughs> You're going to just write it down and go back and listen, to, you know, look it up later and listen to me as I read it. Okay, so James chapter 1, verse 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows, okay? And so when we think about does and is the Father, is He the Creator? Well, we see here that God is being displayed as the Father, isn't He? And He is being displayed as the Father of the heavenly lights. And you say, well, what are the heavenly lights? The heavenly lights are the stars, okay? It's the sun, it's the moon. And so God is the father of the sun and moon and stars and the fact that he has created the sun, moon, and stars. So when we think about the father, the father is obviously the creator, and that's something that we can go, oh yeah, that, that is. But what about the sun? Well, taking a look um, at John chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 3, book of John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1, we see that it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now let's understand that that Word that's there is not talking about a Word like, you know, a, a lettered Word, but that Word is really talking about Jesus Christ. And you say, well, why do, is it talking about Jesus Christ? Well, because you go to verse number 14, and it says that the Word was made flesh. And so this is obviously talking about God the Son. And notice that he says this, in verse number two, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so not only did God the Father create the world, but God the Son was involved in the creation as well. And as a matter of fact, you look at it and it's pretty exact, isn't it? I mean, it's very specific. There's no wiggle room there. I mean, it just says, through him, all things were made. And we could just simply stop right there and say, yes, the Son is the Creator. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And so the Son was not just simply involved in a little bit of the creation. The Son was involved in all of the creation. And you say, okay, well, what about God the Holy Spirit? Well, that one's pretty easy, too, when you go back to the very first verses of the Bible in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, and in verse 1, it just simply says this. It says, um, <clears throat> well, let me flip over there. Got to get past all the little pages first before we get to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And notice in verse number 2, it says this. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over over the waters. So right off the bat, we see in the creative process, the Spirit of God was involved. And so is, do we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Yes. Can we say that all three of these were God? For the fact that they were and are all three the Creator? Yes. Now what about all-powerful? Okay, so taking a look way back to the book of John, chapter 10, in the book of John chapter 10, we see that Jesus is talking to the Jews and as he is talking about himself and as he's talking about the Father, we can see that Jesus is talking about how he and the Father are both all-powerful. All right, so John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, in verse number 25, we see that uh, Jesus says this. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe the miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now I picked this verse of Scripture because I want us to talk about the all-powerfulness, the omnipotence of both the Father and the Son. All right? 
What we see here is the omnipotence or the all-powerfulness of the Father. As a matter of fact, Jesus says there in verse number 25, my Father who has given, me, uh, given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so when we think about all those that believe in Jesus Christ, those are there in the Father's hand, and nobody is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand because the Father is more powerful than all of them. And so when we talk about God being all-powerful, the Father is definitely fits that bill. And I don't think that there's going to be a whole lot of people that would argue that, right? If you're going to say that there's a God, if you're going to say that God is, is all-powerful, then you're going to say, yeah, the, the, the Father meets that billing. But I also want you to see this, that Jesus says that no one can snatch them out of my hand. And so not only are we in the, the Son's hand, but we're in the Father's hands, and that makes us, if you will, doubly secure, even though you can't really get you know, more secure than being in the Father's hands. But if you could, you could say that you're doubly secure, but nobody can snatch them out of the Son's hands. Now, somebody will say, okay, but Jesus just said that the Father is greater than all, but also realize that he is not including himself in saying that he is below the Father. As a matter of fact, he's putting himself up on the same level as the Father by first of all saying nobody can snatch them out of my hand, nobody can snatch them out of my Father's hand, but also by saying this in verse number 30, and that is, I and the Father am one. And so Jesus was one with the Father, and because he was one with the Father, don't you see that they are equal together? You know, one thing that we understand about the Trinity is that, yes, there are three distinct persons, but these three distinct persons are all going to be equal with one another. And Jesus is saying that he is equal with God because he is professing his divinity, to which the Jews got so upset that they wanted to go and stone him for it later in the chapter. Now, we see that about um, the Father. We see that about the Son. But what about the Holy Spirit? Can we say that the Holy Spirit is um, omnipotent as well? Well, if you kind of go back, and the reason why I wanted to read verse number 25 is because you notice that Jesus is talking about the miracles. The miracles that he did was proof of the fact that he came from the Father. And so the reason why Jesus perform miracles upon this earth was not because he wanted to cure people and heal people. I mean, don't misunderstand me. Jesus did, and he wanted to be and was compassionate with people. But the purpose of the miracles was not to go and do those things. Instead, the purpose of the miracles was that so people could see the miracles, and even though Jesus, who had the appearance and the form of a mere man, they could say, wait a minute, there is something special about him. There is something peculiar about him. What is that? This man has to be from God. And indeed he was. And so it was the miracles and the power of God working through the miracles that displayed that. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because if you go over and take a look at the next verse, Romans chapter 15 and verse 19, Romans 15 and 19. In Romans chapter 15, verse number 19, Paul's talking about um, his ministry. He's talking about what he's done and explaining to the Gentiles about what he has done all through the way. And so um, if you take a look at verse number 19, though, as he's talking about how God used him to go and preach uh, to people, notice he says in verse number 19, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. And so Paul and other people like Peter went and continued Jesus' ministry. And the miracles that they were able to do during that time period showed that they were from the Father in the same way that um, the miracle showed that Jesus was from the Father too. And do you see by what power Paul, Peter, and the others were able to do it. It was by the Spirit of God. And so by the Spirit of God, we see that miracles were worked, the power of the Spirit. And we see by the Father and the power of the Father, the miracles were worked, and by the Son as well. So 
both the Father, or all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have all of that equal power. And not only that, but they are all three eternal. Take a look at John chapter 17 and verse number 5. John chapter 17 and verse number 5. I think that we could probably say, you know, as far as the Creator, as far as all-powerful, eternal, that we can say, oh yeah, God the Father is all of these things. But I want you to take a look at John chapter 17 and verse number 5. Now, Jesus, as He is praying this prayer before His crucifixion to the Father, He says this in verse 5. He says, And now, Father, glorify me in Your presence with the glory I had with You before the world began. And so when we think about what eternity past is, eternity past is just simply the time before there was no time, before the world began. And so here is the Son coexisting with the Father, and both of them had uh, glory in eternity past. And so we can say that God the Father definitely had and was eternal. And God the Son is that way too. But you know, some people say, well, that doesn't do it enough for me. Well, okay, just simply go over to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, one of the last uh, verses in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, in verse number seven, uh, 13, Jesus said this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so Jesus, the Son of God, is eternal. Father's eternal, the Son's eternal. Well, what about the Spirit? Well, take a look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 14. So, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, and in verse number 14, it says this, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself, um, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences uh, from acts that lead to death. Notice that eternal spirit that is there. And so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three of them in the Bible are shown to be eternal. All three of them in the Bible are shown to be all-powerful. All three of them in the Bible are shown to be the Creator. So what does that show? Well, it shows that we've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who are all three God. But at the same time, there's one God, right? As a matter of fact, the Shema. Deuteronomy chapter four, uh, 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. At no time in the Bible will you see that there are a multitude of gods. There is only one God, the true and the living God. So it's not as if there is God by committee. It's not as if that God is going and just simply taking different roles. It's not as if that there are the Father being God and then a subset of Him. There's one God. And that one God has three distinct personages, personalities, persons. Again, we don't have the word for it. But those are co-equal with God. Those are eternal with God. And they work together in harmony. And they work together in unison. But there's one God. And again, you say, I don't understand it. And I'm going to say, I don't understand it either. But I do understand this. I understand what the Bible reveals to us, and the Bible does reveal there's one God, and the Bible does reveal to us that God Father, God the Holy uh, Spirit, and God the Son are all part of it. And maybe one day when I get to heaven, when I start to see things that are beyond this world, then maybe I can say, hey, you know what? I've got a good analogy. I want to go back and I want to tell people about it. And I'll go back and I'll say, hey, you know what? Oh, you don't know that, so I don't even know how to describe it to you, right? It's just simply the way it is. 
But what are we going to do with all of this? You know, what are we going to say? Um, one thing that we can say is from this is that we need faith to accept it, right? You know? And as a matter of fact, when you talk about God, we need faith to accept all the things about God. The fact that He exists. The fact that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. The fact that He is eternal. The fact that He is righteous. And the fact that He's loving. And the fact that He's merciful. And the fact that He is going to come and judge. We need to understand all of these things. And we need to understand all of these things by faith. And once we do then we can start to take those answers and we can start to better understand God. And once we do that, then we can maybe even kind of understand a little bit about how God is working. We can see how there is God the Father and we can see that while Jesus was on the earth, He said, I have not come to do my will, but the will of my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Jesus, because Jesus is holy, He is always going to conform to what the Father wanted Him to do. We can see that when uh, Jesus died, that the Holy Spirit rose him from the grave. We say, but wait a minute, how can the Holy Spirit resurrect, or how can Jesus resurrect himself if he's, if he's dead? Well, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. How can God be everywhere? How can God be in our midst today? And at the same time, we look at Jesus, and we can see, well, Jesus is a person, though. You see, once we start to understand a little bit more about what the Trinity is, we can uh, understand these questions, right? But this is one thing that we don't need to do, is that we don't need to just simply look at the Trinity as far as being some sort of theological uh, definition, some sort of theological argument. When we start to just simply look at the Trinity as a theological point of view, that we acknowledge, then we might be kind of hitting off on the wrong base. You know, there's some people who say, okay, as far as the Trinity goes, um, the Trinity, uh, yeah, I, I understand it because I know this definition, and this definition has been come up with, with all of these uh, theologians and creeds and everything like that, and so I confess this to be true. And at the same time, we look at other things and other definitions of the Trinity that aren't true. If, if we come up and say, oh, well, well, well that, that's not true. If we come up and say, here is this theological definition that we're going to confess and acknowledge to be true, and therefore, because we confess and acknowledge it to be true, we're righteous, and here are these false definitions about the Trinity that we are confessing are not true, and we are rejecting them, then therefore, we are righteous. Do you see how that kind of leads itself to pride? We come up with the idea of we are righteous, we are good, we are wholesome Christians because we know and accept these things. That's not what faith is. Faith is something different. Faith is the belief in our heart that the Bible is what it is, that what the Word of God says means it. And when we start to, to hear these things and we understand them and we take them in and we trust them, that's what faith is. And once we get to that point, it shouldn't elevate us to a sense of pride of where we're thinking we're better than other people. What it really should be doing is it should be showing us the awesomeness of God. I mean, how awesome is God that we cannot even understand who He is. Have you stopped to think about that? I mean, many times we just simply go through our lives and say, well, here's God. You know, we pray God, we worship God, we serve God, and it's God, right? But then there's times that we start to really think about it. And we start to think about God's traits and attributes, like, him being eternal, and we think, wait a minute, I don't get that. But you know what? That's just simply the way God is. The Trinity. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I understand what the Bible reveals to us, but I don't understand it. But that's the way God is. 
how great and how mighty and how awesome is someone that you can't even understand their existence. Isn't that incredible? And when we start to think about that, then what happens is we start to worship. We start to respect. What happens is we start to fear God. Not be afraid of God, but we start to fear God in terms of respecting Him. We start to say, wait a minute, this, this God, I can't even understand Him. He's so great. He's so mighty. He's so powerful. He's so... I, I don't... I can't even... My mind can't even grasp around it. I need to follow Him. I need to worship Him. I need to serve Him. And from that, we do worship Him. And we do serve Him. And so, from all this, are we believing what the Bible says about God? You know, we can see, oh, God the Father, yeah, that's God. We can even say, well, God the Spirit, you know, Spirit of God. God the Son. Jesus told his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. He and the Father were one. We can believe in God. We can believe in, in Jesus. We can believe in the Father. We can believe in the Son. But what we can believe about the Son is just simply this, that the Father sent the Son to die on Calvary's cross for our sins so that if we will just simply not just simply acknowledge it, not just confess it to be true, but believe it. Believe it for ourselves. Believe that Jesus Christ really did come to this earth to save us because we're sinners. And we did it because God has this incredible love for us because we're His creation. And because Jesus went and led the life that we couldn't and offered that life as a substitute for us on Calvary's cross, and we take that and we say, you know, that is our salvation. That is what we believe wholeheartedly. And then we turn to God and we ask Him for forgiveness. And so today, whether you're watching us on Facebook or you're here, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, I invite you to do so. I invite you to look and see the grand plan that God had for each and every one of us because He loves each and every one of us. And for us to just simply go and turn to the Father and accept Him, accept what Jesus has done for us. And if you're saved, then let's look at the Trinity, not just simply with, hey, this is a cool theological thing that we know and look at us, we're so good. But instead, to look at it and say, wow, God is incredible. God is awesome. And it's amazing that He has the grace and the mercy for each one of us. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for the time that we spent in your word this morning. Lord, I ask that you would please take your word and apply it to our hearts and to our lives and help us to um, know you and understand you better. Help us to see you for God and help us to have a, a, a righteous fear of you, Lord. Help us to worship you. Help us to respect you for everything that you've done for us and everything that you are. And Lord, you really are truly higher than the heavens. You are beyond the scope of our imaginations. And for you who are so mighty and so powerful to love us enough that you would be willing to, uh, to have a relationship with us. And not only that, but to, um, but to provide it with an ultimate sacrifice and to love us with this great, incredible love. Lord, we, we don't deserve any of this but I ask that you would please help us to live our lives that are worthy of you and worthy of your calling. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.